I was thinking about what's the thing that I'm going to appreciate most when all the various restrictions go. Um, I'm glad that I'm going to be able to go to, to Phillips there this week to see my mum and dad on Wednesday morning. That'd be really nice. But I think that the best thing will be worshipping God together. Uh, because that's the closest we get to a, a taste of heaven when we come. And we don't just worship as we sing. We worship as we pray. We worship as we join with our hearts uh, in the words of the songs, the words of the prayers, but also as we listen to uh, what God has to say to us from his word. We're starting a new series. Line of Duty finishes tonight. And from what I can gather, I've only seen a couple of glimpses of it, it's been a very tortuous plot through, I don't know, five or six seasons, and people are desperate to find out who is the big bad person H. Well, I can't promise that two Peter will be quite the same, but there is a sense of, of building towards something because as we begin our studies uh, in two Peter, we're going to find it's a real contrast from judges. That's all we're going to be looking at today. It's a bit different from the three chapters we tried to cover last Sunday. And of course the, the feel of judges is very different from the feel of a, a New Testament letter. This Bible book is going to be much easier for us to connect with. Uh, it's two God's people, written to God's people, living in the same sort of world as the world of Judges. All the different, there were differences in the, the politics and the national situation and the religious situation, but human beings hadn't changed from the days of the Judges to the days of the New Testament. And they haven't changed right up until today, 2,000 years more or less later. We're the same sort of people as the people Peter was writing to. Now this letter was written by Peter towards the end of his life. Just a little advanced glimpse of verse 15. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. He's talking about his death. We don't know exactly the time, uh, we don't know how close it was to his death, but he's conscious, as we all should be, that we are closer to death than we were yesterday. Mm. And, and Peter's a, a long way down the road. Before he goes, he's got some very important things that he wants to say. And our, our discovery as we work our way through this letter will be to find out what it is that was so important then, and so important that God thought, God knew, God didn't just think, God knew it would be valuable to the church right the way through the ages. Quite how we're going to progress through the letter, well Keith and I need to have a conversation this week to break it up into to sections, how, how big, how small will they be? They won't all be that small, um, but we're certainly not going to do three chapters in one go. Otherwise, that's the letter come to an end. We want to, to focus on uh, the words a bit more closely than we did in something like Judges. It's a different sort of, of part of the Bible. And so that's our, our passage for this afternoon. Let's start off with the writer of the letter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Not the, the casual hi of an email these days, which has changed things from dear so-and-so, now it's hi so-and-so. Uh, I don't know if people actually write that in letters, but I'm not sure people write letters anymore. It starts differently because Greek culture was different. In the days when there was a, a structure, it was dear so-and-so, yours faithfully, yours sincerely, so my name, the writer. But the Greek started with who it's from. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is he? Well, we probably know a bit about Peter, don't we? We've read bits of our Bible before, we've heard lots of stories about him. We need to go to, to Matthew 4 to find the start of his story, at least as far as uh, the New Testament is concerned. And you'll remember that Peter was a fisherman. Matthew 4, verse 18. Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus says, and I will send you out to fish for people. 
At once they left their nets and followed him. Galilee, in the north of, of Israel, um, a bit more of a rough and ready area than Jerusalem, which was the centre. Fishermen, not particularly uh, educated, although he probably had his own business, a small businessman we'd say today. But, but not really anybody, Simon and his brother Andrew. And we're going to pick up more details from Simon Peter's story as we work through this letter, because we can find bits of his experience that link with some of the things he says. We'll do that even this afternoon. But he describes himself as Christ's servant and apostle. To be a servant of God was a, a really high thing in the Old Testament. If you read through, uh, the sort of people who are described as servants of God are Abraham, and Elijah, but in particular, Moses and David. So to be a servant of God seems to make you quite significant, quite important, but of course we know that in the New Testament, the word that Peter uses is that word doulos. Uh, servant, slave, we find uh, a little bit hard to try and pin down exactly what it's meant because we have uh, conceptions of slavery that generally go back to the 18th and 19th century. Uh, that's not what Roman slavery was like. But it meant you belonged to somebody. You were owned by somebody. You served a master. And the master that Peter served had taught him a lesson about being a servant. Perhaps you remember that story from John chapter 13 when uh, preparing for uh, the Passover festival. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And when he's come to the, the end of that, Peter's resisted that. We might talk about that a bit later uh, in the series. But, but when Jesus has demonstrated what he, he wants to show to his disciples, he asks them if they understand what he's done. And then he says, you call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, for this is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So, Peter had been taught that to be a servant of Jesus Christ was a, a humble thing. He knew that, and he, he claimed that role, if you like. But there was more than that. He'd been taught humility by, well, I can remember Michael too, who often used to call Jesus the master. And I was always a little bit uncomfortable about that, because it sounded a little like, a bit like Doctor Who or something, some science fiction thing. But, but, but if we understand it properly, Jesus was the master of Peter, his servant, his slave. And yet there was more to it because he was a servant and an apostle. Peter had been appointed a messenger for Jesus, one of 12 chosen especially. We find that uh, explained to us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And the first name in the list is Simon, whom Jesus named Peter. So there were more than 12 disciples, but Jesus chose 12 in particular to be apostles, to be messengers. And as we'll see later on in the series, to be witnesses to all that he did, and in particular, to his resurrection. So, Peter had been given by Jesus special responsibility, and in particular, special authority. He served Jesus, he spoke for Jesus. And that's going to be very important as we continue reading this letter. But again... 
we discover that Jesus has already modelled for, for Simon Peter the way he should be. Because just as Jesus had shown uh, Simon about being a servant, Jesus has also shown Simon about how he should speak on behalf of somebody else. Because that's exactly what Jesus said he had done. At the end of John chapter 12, Jesus is talking about his message. Uh, and he talks about those words in Isaiah that some of us looked at not so very long ago, about the fact that some people wouldn't believe. He tells us there that Isaiah uh, said these things because he saw Jesus' glory. Well, that's a mind-boggling thing, isn't it? Isaiah, 700 years earlier, seeing Jesus' glory. Well, we can talk about that another time, perhaps. But Jesus then goes on to say, I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And we can expect Peter to say just what Jesus has told him to say. He's had a model. He's had a model for his being a servant. He's had a model for him being a, an apostle, a messenger. So as he starts this letter, he's really saying, I'm writing to you as somebody who is under authority, but as somebody who is God authority, I'm with authority as well, as Christ's servant and Christ's spokesman. And as I said, that's going to be important because sleep preview, the big thing that Peter is writing about, that he's concerned about, is false teaching coming into the church and taking uh, Christians away from the truth uh, of Jesus Christ. It'll take us a little while to get there, but we will, uh, believe me. So, what about this afternoon? What do we take for ourselves from uh, just that first phrase? Well, we need to think about, and we'll do more about this, who do we listen to? Who do we trust? Of all the voices telling us things and, and claiming to speak for Jesus, there are some big differences in the world. That's a question we'll need to return to. But Peter's attitude, Peter's role is a, a model for, for any Christian witness, and that includes us, doesn't it, if we're believers in Jesus. When we are representing him to other people, Keith mentioned Leicester Square evangelism, but it might just be in a, an everyday conversation. I saw Joy chatting to one of our neighbours on the roof garden earlier uh, this afternoon. It could be something like that. It could be somebody at work. It could be just a conversation on the bus. Who knows? But, but when we're talking, and a conversation comes round to spiritual sort of things. Do we sometimes come across as being quite arrogant? has been quite proud about who we are. We know that the Jews in the Old Testament are proud of their, their chosen people status. And they re rested on that often more than their relationship with God. But are we possibly guilty of that? We need the humility of, of a servant, don't we? And when we're talking with people, is it really us against them? We're in an argument and we've got to win it. But I'll be honest, I've found that quite an easy position to get into myself in the past. You have a conversation and you want to tell somebody about Jesus, but actually when you stop and think afterwards, you realise that Jesus really didn't come into it much. You were trying to win. That's not good. And sometimes even we want to present our own ideas, things that we think, rather than things that we know to be true from the Bible. Well, Peter wouldn't do that. Peter's telling us this afternoon, if we are believers in Jesus, we belong to Christ. We are his. And we are to serve him in all that we do. But who was Peter writing to? Well, the next phrase tells us who those readers were. Those who, through the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, have received the faith as precious as ours. It doesn't name them. Who were they? Where were they? Well, a little later on in Peter's letter, we discover that these are the same people that Peter was writing to in his first letter. 
So 2 Peter 3 and verse 1, he says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Okay, so well, who was he writing to in the first letter? Turn back to 1 Peter, at the beginning of that letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter's not writing to one particular person, to one particular church. He's writing to Christians in a, a group of churches, but they're, they're scattered around. This letter is going to be passed on. Perhaps there were lots of copies, uh, and they went to different places, or perhaps one letter kept going from place to place. But it's a general letter. And in a way, that helps us this afternoon, doesn't it? Uh, it's easier to see how a general letter can apply not just geographically, but across time, too. Uh, this is timeless truth for us. Two things mark out these people. They have a faith as precious as ours. And the question is, what is that faith? Well, you remember that Peter has uh, two men. Simon called Peter. Jesus named Simon Peter. And Peter is Greek. Uh, Cephas is an Aramaic version of the same name. And those names mean stone or, or rock. We have to go to Matthew uh, 16 uh, to find out what that's all about. You remember that Jesus asked his disciples who people thought he was. And they told him what people were saying. Some were saying he was John the Baptist, come back come back to life. That was a bit weird. Some people said he was Elijah or another prophet. But then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus goes on to, to speak to Simon. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You have an earthly father, but my Father, God himself, has revealed this to you. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. Peter's faith was that Jesus was the one whom God had promised, the Messiah, the Christ. That was a, a personal conviction. Peter wasn't speaking, this is what some people are saying. This, this is who you are. This is what I believe. This is what I'm committed to. That you are the one whom God has promised down the ages and now you've arrived. And Peter was ready to testify to him. And although we know there was a blip, when Jesus was on his way to the cross, when we turn to, to Acts, when the Holy Spirit has come down on the apostles in, in power, Peter is preaching. This is the message that he has to proclaim to his fellow Israelites. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That was a hugely unpopular message with the authorities. But that was Peter's personal conviction, personal commitment. And because of that, uh, Jesus is saying, you're part of the foundation of the church. Now, Roman Catholics go beyond that. They say that this passage from Matthew that I read earlier on goes on to, to indicate that Peter is the, the head of the church. And they've turned that into the role of the Pope. And of course, Protestants say that's not what it means at all. And there's all sorts of reasons why that is. Now we say, Peter and his faith, that's the foundation of the church. That's what God is building his church on. Jesus Christ is the, the chief cornerstone. But the apostles and prophets of the New Testament days are the, the foundation of this church that's being built up. And we are somewhere quite high up. I don't know if it's as big as the shard, but you get the idea. 
Uh, there's been a lot of history since then. And tied into this commitment to Jesus, you see what Peter calls it? Our God and Saviour. Now, some people don't like that. Some people can't handle that. Jehovah's Witnesses in particular have a different translation. They talk about the righteousness of our God and the Saviour. Two different. It's not what it says. It's not how you should translate the Greek. I'm not an expert, but I've looked at people who are. And they say, no, the way the Greek is written is calling Jesus both God and Saviour. This is the, the Jesus that Peter believes in. This is the Pe Jesus that Peter uh, is going to preach. Without lessening God, God has come to earth as a man to save us. And that's astonishing. Mm. But that's what Peter's message was. And these readers had that faith. They shared that faith. They'd come to believe in Jesus in just the same way as Peter did. And therefore, Peter tells us that there's an equality between us. Because they had the same faith, they were on a level with the apostle. Your faith is the same faith as ours, as precious, equal in honour to ours, equal in value, if you like. Not because of the readers of the letter, not because of Peter himself, but because of God. Because of the Lord Jesus. It's his righteousness that has brought about this faith in their lives. His righteousness in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. His righteousness in his saving his people. His righteousness in giving faith to his people. And Peter's saying that we are linked. As I write to you, these Christians, we share the same faith. We're on the level. And if he's saying that to them then, surely he's saying that to us today, if we believe in the same Lord Jesus. We have a faith as precious as theirs. It's what links all Christians, the very earliest ones, and the most recent person to come to faith today and say, I believe, I take Jesus as my saviour, linked by this one faith. And it's the faith that all of us need. Do you have it this afternoon? If you don't have that faith in Jesus Christ, you need to ask for it. Because uh, no faith, or faith in a different Jesus, will not do. The Bible's very clear. Salvation comes by faith in, in Jesus Christ alone, and the Jesus that God has revealed. The real Jesus. Not a Jesus that we've made up or twisted. Again, there's more about that later in the letter. But if you do have that faith, then you're linked with Peter, with these readers, with every believer in every age. And then we've got, well, the greeting, I suppose. It's something we might expect to be at the end. We don't tend to say very much at the beginning of a letter. I suppose... When you're at school, you're told to write sample letters to somebody. You might say, dear so-and-so, I hope you are well. And then you write something about what you're meant to be writing about. Well, in Greek uh, culture, when they wrote a letter, they would wish good health to the person they were writing to at the beginning. But this is much more than, I hope you are well. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The commentators call this a wish prayer, <laughs> which sounds a bit vague to me, but I guess what we need to understand is it's the heart of the writer expressed to the readers, but really it's expressed to God. Lord, give grace and peace to these people. May you know these things, he says to his readers. Grace and peace, free forgiveness to those who are guilty and undeserving. Peace with God. You couldn't ask for anything more. Peter wants the best for those he's writing to. And you might think, well, hang on a second, if they're Christians, they've already received grace. They already have peace with God. But grace and peace are not a one-off gift. And 
if you start to think about Peter's story, you might remember uh, that Peter knew all about that. I've mentioned the blip in his service of the Lord Jesus. You remember his bold assertion, I'll never leave you, Jesus. It doesn't matter what happens, I'll stay with you to the death. And of course, when Jesus was arrested and taken to be questioned, and Peter was asked, oh, you, you're with Jesus, aren't you? He denied his Lord and his Master three times. But if you go to the end of John's Gospel, to chapter 21, you read how Jesus tells Peter that, that he's welcome back. Oh, Peter has been part of the group of uh, disciples ever since Jesus has first appeared to them. Peter hasn't left that group. But it seems quite clear that Peter is still suffering inside from his failure. He has let Jesus down in the, the worst possible way. And yet if you read through uh, the end of John 21, you see Jesus restoring Peter, giving him a role to play. He's, he's reappointing him, if you like, as an apostle. Peter hasn't uh, lost any hope of service. Peter isn't put on the outside. Jesus gives Peter a job to do. So Peter knew the grace of God in an ongoing way. He knew the forgiveness of Jesus in a very particular situation. Peter's internal trouble, the broken relationship that must, he must have felt in those days. Jesus finally, if you like, puts his arm around him and reassures him, no, you're all right, Peter, carry on serving me. And we're being encouraged here, just as those early readers were, to realise that we can have peace restored when our peace is disturbed. We can be forgiven again if we need it. We've prayed for that already in our service, but we need to really uh, not just say it, we need to take it into our hearts. Very easy for Christians to, to labour on with a burden of guilt. And we don't need to if we are truly repentant in our hearts, because our God is a gracious and forgiving God. And when our peace is disturbed, whether it's disturbed by our circumstances or by our sin, we've got somewhere, we've got someone to go to. We've got someone who will forgive us. We've got someone who will not let us go. And that's a wonderful truth. So Peter encouraging his readers to, to want grace and peace we should be encouraged to want grace and peace too. They're there for us from God. And the key is knowing God. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now there's a, a distinction there that isn't in the earlier uh, verse, part of the verse. Because here we do have God and Jesus our Lord. Earlier on, we've got one God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, but now we've got God and Jesus our Lord. And although Peter isn't working out here the doctrine of the Trinity in great detail, uh, I'm not sure if he fully understood it at that stage. Well, who could? He's indicating that uh, as well as one God, that one God has, uh, well, not three persons presented here, just Father and Son, if you like, but the Spirit also, is indicating that there is more to God than just unity. He's saying that we have God, Almighty God, we can know as our Father through Jesus, but we also have Jesus our Lord. Jesus, the one who commands our, our highest allegiance. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should be very careful not to give that loyalty, that commitment to anyone else. We shouldn't give it to our, our government, to the state. We shouldn't give it to our family. We shouldn't give it to our boss. Jesus is Lord. And all those other things and other people have a place underneath that. But Jesus is Lord. And we need to remember that. But we need God's grace. We need peace with God. And through Jesus, we are invited to have that relationship uh, in which grace and peace can be ours. I mentioned that sermon in the Acts of the Apostles. And Peter goes on uh, to tell uh, the folk who are listening to him exactly what that involves. Because they hear his message, 
that they are guilty, guilty of putting to death God's chosen one, and they are cut to the heart. What shall we do? And Peter gives them hope. Grace and peace are possible. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Through Jesus, we're invited into this relationship where grace and peace can be ours. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means depending on God. It means enjoying his blessing in our lives every day. And perhaps particularly when we lack peace. It's not just about when we sin and disturb our relationship with God that way, as Peter did. That can be restored, forgiveness is ours. But peace in the sense of being settled, whatever is going on around us, because we are dependent on God himself. How can that apply to, to your life? Well, when friends, our so-called friends, are causing you problems, knowing God can give you peace in that situation. When you're nervous and anxious about what might be going on in, in your block of flats, you're not quite sure who's there. Knowing God can give you peace in that situation. When there's pressure at work, you've got too much to do and too little time to do it in. Knowing God can bring peace to you. When you're fed up of living in the city, knowing God can bring you peace that you're in the place that he's put you in. As you get older and you realise your body is not what it was and you wonder about what might be ahead, God can give you peace. As you're concerned about those you love, God can give you peace. As you're battling with all sorts of bureaucracy, trying to sort forms and paperwork and legal stuff out, God can give you peace. It doesn't depend on you. This is the relationship that Jesus brings us into with the living God. It's through knowing God, through knowing Jesus our Lord, that we have how much peace, how much grace? Yours in abundance, lots and lots and lots, and you can never get to the end of it. And how do we do that? Well, it's simple. <laughs> it's the same thing we always say. Spend time with God. Talk to him. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how you're thinking. But then ask him to be involved in that situation. Listen to what he tells you through his word. Go to him when you're conscious of your need. Don't try and work it out yourself. Don't tell him what to do, but know that he's there. Know that he's with you. Know his love <laughs> and accept the way he has for you to go. We need to find out more about Peter's main concerns as we read on in this letter. But right at the very beginning, we can ask the question, is Peter writing to you? Are you someone who shares his faith? Is Jesus your God, your Saviour, your Lord? If you say he is, could anyone tell? People watch us, don't they? They think things about us, and often we perhaps wouldn't like to know what they think. He's a massive Chelsea fan. She really likes dogs. It wouldn't it be great if people said, Joy, she follows Jesus. Debbie, <laughs> she's a Christian. Get the idea? And how will they know? Do you need God's grace and God's peace? This afternoon, we're going to keep coming back to this, that the answer, the key to, to all of life, is a personal relationship with God, knowing God, knowing Jesus, and thankfully, through Jesus, all of us are invited to come.